We are turning now in the Seeking Savior preaching series. If you're new to Noah Community Church, we're going verse by verse through the gospel according to Luke to two brief verses with the header in the ESV of Jesus begins his ministry. So this is chapter 14, verses 14 to 15. So we've seen the baptism of Jesus followed by a genealogy and then the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness led by the Holy Spirit. Well, this brief statement here could be combined with the rejection of Jesus at Nazareth, but I've actually saved that for next week's sermon because I, as I mind into these two verses, this represents practically or most, most positively about a year of Jesus' life. So this actually sets up the context of a rejection scene, but it's been called the Galilean springtime because Jesus is traveling a great region, preaching in various synagogues all over that region and receiving great acceptance initially as well. And so I want to camp out of these two verses this morning. I've entitled today's sermon, The Jesus Report, because you'll see that a report goes out about Jesus and word is on the street about this new preacher, this new healer, this new rabbi. And so the positive news about Jesus is spreading all over Galilee. So just follow along. I'll read verses 14 and 15 together. We'll pray for this message and then jump into the Jesus Report. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. So he's returned from where? From the wilderness. And a report about him went out through all the surrounding country. And he, Jesus, taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. The Jesus report. Let's pray. Well, Jesus, we thank you that this good news not only spread in that early area of Galilee, but continues to spread all over the world. We thank you for this great good news that has found us in 2024 here in Havertown, Pennsylvania. And Lord Jesus, you are still alive. Your teaching is still changing hearts, and the power of the Holy Spirit is still present. And so God, as we see the glory of Jesus on display in this passage, may you get glory from each one of our lives through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. You see that as Jesus is going in the power of the Holy Spirit, verse 14, a report went out about him throughout all the surrounding country. Reports spread through the human race pretty quickly, don't they? <laughs> Especially today in light of social media, if something happens, boom, the whole world can know. But this is not just a trend with digital media. This is something that we've been doing for a long, long time. And 2,000 years ago, as Jesus goes from synagogue to synagogue, the report is out. Before newspapers, we are still good at spreading the news, spreading the report. It made me think of another great preacher before the dawn of the internet by the name of Charles Spurgeon. And Charles Spurgeon, I have a biography about, about him here. He has been called the Prince of Preachers in London. And he preached to thousands in his congregation. But before that, he was a kid. He was a 19-year-old just preaching in the backwoods and wherever he had a chance at Sunday school. And as a 19-year-old, Providence would have him to preach at Cambridge or, or share at Cambridge, and he was discovered there. So I want to read this. A man named George Gould was present at the meeting in Cambridge, and he was deeply impressed by Spurgeon's ministry and gave a London friend... William Olney, a glowing report of the young Water Beach preacher. Water Beach is outside of London in the, the backwoods. Olney was a deacon of the New Street, excuse me, New Park Street Baptist Church. And since it was without a pastor at the time, Gold urged it to seriously consider this remarkable youth. Again, he's 19 years old. The New Park Street Church invited Spurgeon to supply its pulpit for a Sunday. He was amazed at the request and replied to their letter, saying they must have the wrong Spurgeon, for he was merely a youth of 19. They replied that it, he was the one that they had intended, so he agreed to spend Sunday, December 18th, 1853, with them. And that Sunday, history was made, and all of us in the Christian church would never be the same. He went to a church that could seat up to 1,200 people in one sanctuary. He went to a, a church that at one time... Uh, one of the pastors was John Gill. And if you studied any commentaries, John Gill wrote a lot of commentaries. A church that at one time was full. By the time Spurgeon reached there, they had three prominent preachers and they were without a pastor for quite a season. It had dwindled down to between 80 and 200 people in this huge sanctuary. 
And this young 19-year-old got up there to preach to probably less than 100 people. And as he preached the gospel of God with power, and the power of the Holy Spirit with unction and earnestness, people were overwhelmed with the word of God and the maturity of this young man filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, those were the days where everybody guarded all of Sunday, the Lord's Day. So they went to church in the morning and the evening. And word spread between the morning service of about 80 people so that by the evening service, the sanctuary was nearly filled. He went back to his uh, little town and, and word came out, we want you to be our pastor. He said, listen, I didn't go to seminary. I haven't been ordained. You got the wrong guy. And they said, no, the spirit of God is upon you. We want you to be our pastor. Eventually, he reluctantly accepted, and he was off to the races. There, a prominent preacher in London, and gave the next few decades of his life to reaching people for Christ, spreading the gospel of God. And many of us still enjoy his commentaries and his devotionals today because of his faithfulness to the Lord Jesus Christ. We see here how quickly reports can spread and create momentum in regions and even globally. Well, here are these two verses Luke, inspired by the Holy Spirit, after Jesus is tempted in the wilderness, does a summary of about 12 months of Jesus' life before he is rejected in Nazareth. And if you read it at first blush and just go, it's sort of like, yeah, Jesus is popular, and then they hate him. But I want to pause here, because before Jesus was rejected, his message received wide acclaim, esteem, and glory, we're told, from all. The report is out in the region as Jesus goes around. And what is this report spreading around Jesus? There are three things that Jesus is trending in, if you will, in social media, and these are the three things. Jesus embodies and spreads, first, the Spirit's power. Secondly, Jesus embodies and spreads kingdom teaching, and Jesus embodies and spreads gospel glory. So let's look at all of these three points because they not only mark the summary of Jesus' two years, or excuse me, this one year, but really all of Jesus' ministry throughout his whole three-year period. Let's look at the first point. Jesus embodies and spreads the Spirit's excuse me, the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse 14, we're told, and Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and a report about him went out throughout all the surrounding country. The first thing we discover about Jesus is people listen to the teaching of Jesus, which will be our second point, was not only the content of the message, but the power by which that message came to individuals. He moved in the power of God. He moved in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, for those of you who've been in this preaching series for a while, that really shouldn't surprise us, right? Because Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit with the Virgin Mary. We're told that the Holy Spirit would come upon her and he would be the Holy Son of God. And we see at the baptism of Jesus where the Holy Spirit descends upon Jesus as John the Baptist baptizes him in the river. We see that the Spirit of God leads Jesus into the wilderness. That was last week, right? He was filled with the Holy Spirit, led by the Spirit. Well, in that very same Spirit that filled him at his baptism, that very same Spirit that conceived him, that very same Spirit that led him into the wilderness is the very same Spirit that then drove him in power in his ministry. In fact, next week we'll look at Jesus rejected in Nazareth. And what he starts with is the Isaiah scroll of chapter 61. And what does he say? The spirit of the Lord is upon me. Why? Because he has anointed me to preach good news. And what does he then say? Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. I am the anointed one filled with the Holy Spirit to bring this good news to the whole world. And we see Jesus in this Galilee region, and now we're pretty far removed from this area. I want to read William Barclay's description of this region because it helps set some context to how big of an area this is. He says, Galilee was an area in the north of Palestine, about 50 miles north to south, and about 25 miles from east to west. You can put some pictures up here of Galilee. I have some pictures to show you. The name itself means a circle and comes from the Hebrew word Galil. It was so called because it was encircled by non Jewish nations. Because of that, new influences always played upon Galilee, and it was the most forward looking and least conservative part of Palestine. It was extraordinarily densely populated. Josephus, who himself was at one time governor of the area, says it had 204 villages, 
or towns, none with a population less than 15,000. It seemed incredible that there could be some three million people congregated in Galilee. So as you think about the launch of Jesus' ministry, it's not in some area of obscurity, though John's gospel records most of his travelings to Jerusalem. But this is we're launching into his public ministry in Galilee. These pictures show not only the Jordan River, I think. Can you throw those pictures back up there? There's the Jordan River where Jesus was baptized, pouring into the Sea of Galilee there. Next slide shows uh, where Jesus lived there. So you see that Jesus, he was, grew up in Nazareth and then traveled through Cana. You'll see that and made his way to Capernaum. As we saw in the gospel reading, Jesus set up his hometown in Capernaum. This is also where he calls the disciple Peter. You can actually visit Capernaum to this day to the site believed to be jo uh, Peter's hometown or place where Peter lived, right? And there's some pictures here of synagogues who are from Capernaum. Throw this up there. Here's an ancient synagogue in Capernaum to this day. It's probably from the 4th century on the site of where Jesus likely preached. Not the same building. They built it on top of it. But this just shows you again, this is not once upon a time in the land far, far away, there was a man named Jesus. It's not myth. It's not legend. This really happened. And Jesus traveled through this area. He set up in Capernaum. There is his headquarters. And then he traveled to probably dozens, if not 200 synagogues. Synagogues, right? And synagogues, they appear during this uh, period kind of mysteriously. You're like, well, where did synagogues come from the Bible? They're not commanded. We go to the temple, right? But during the time when Solomon's temple was pulled apart in the 500s, right, and they were in Babylonian exile, these synagogues popped up in the Jewish faith. Very similar to how we do church today. And so they would gather together to study the Torah, to study the law of God, to study the scriptures. There would be a, a public reading of scripture and then a sermon. And there was no paid staff at that point. So they would call itinerant preachers and itinerant teachers and, and rabbis who were traveling. And Jesus is now one of those. That's why they call him rabbi. And we'll see next week. He stands up, reads the Isaiah scroll and starts to preach about himself. But the powerful thing we'll see before we get to the second point is in this region, what is Jesus doing? He's doing great ministry in the power of the Holy Spirit. The unction of God, yes, is the divine son of God. He has great power, but also it is the power from on high that has clothed him so that he's doing these great miracles wherever he goes. And we haven't even seen the miracles yet, but we know that they've been done because next week we'll look. And after he preaches, Isaiah 61 says, the spirit of God is upon me. He's rejected. This is what he said. You're no doubt going to say, physician, heal thyself. All the miracles you did at Capernaum do here. Right? So he already has a reputation for lots of miracles at this point. He already has a reputation for casting out demons. In fact, John's gospel, where he travels through Galilee, that's on his way from Nazareth to, to Capernaum. Cana's in the middle there. He stops for a wedding at Cana. He's already turned water into wine at this point. And so thinking through the chronology at this point, Jesus has revealed his glory through the power of the Holy Spirit, and word is out. Now under each of these three points, go back to the slide where the second point there, Jesus not only embodies the power of the Holy Spirit, go back to the first point, the Spirit's power. He not only embodies the power of the Holy Spirit, but he also spreads it. And that's going to be true of all three of these points, that he spreads these things. And that's why this report not only goes with the news of what Jesus is doing, it actually spreads the power of the Holy Spirit, the teaching of the kingdom, and the glory of the good news with it. That when heaven comes in the person of Christ to bring the kingdom of God, the kingdom message, it comes with the power of the Holy Spirit. People are not only watching the power of the Holy Spirit, they are encountering the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ. In fact, that's exactly what John the Baptist said would happen. Remember? Here we go. When he said, I baptize you with water. The one who is coming after me, who is mightier than I, he baptizes with the Holy Spirit and with fire. That when Jesus comes, he not only receives the Holy Spirit, he is the one that gives the Holy Spirit to you and to me and to wherever the report goes and is received by faith, we receive the Holy Spirit's power. Which is why in the 
book of Acts, we're told by Jesus right before he goes back to the Father, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. One of the things that makes Jesus famous in the world still to this day is not only an ancient message about Jesus, but encountering the living power of the Holy Spirit through Jesus. That's what spreads the report about Jesus. I shared a couple weeks ago that the American church is in decline. We're calling it the great de-churching. And one of our brothers sent me a nice email saying, just a reminder, Stefan, that the uh, global church is doing just fine especially in the global south. And he said, one of the things you notice about the global church in the south is how spirit-filled they are, how many miracles attend the preaching of the gospel there, and how earnest they are in the power of the Holy Spirit. You guys know that this is a Presbyterian church. We're an old Presbyterian church, but I like to tell folks we're a little bit more Presbycostal here. And I think that's biblical, right? We do things decently and in order and with unction and with power, amen? Because Jesus brings the power of the Holy Spirit. We not only have a cognizant that, yeah, the Holy Spirit's the third person of the Trinity, he is the personal power and presence of God given to you and to me through Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus embodies and spreads the Spirit's power. That's why Jesus is trending. That's why Jesus is famous. That's the report spreading all around about Jesus. Secondly, Jesus embodies and spreads not only the Spirit's power, but the kingdom's teaching. The kingdom's teaching, verse 15, he says that the report went out about him throughout all the surrounding country, verse 15, and he taught. He taught in their synagogues being glorified by all. Now, I already shared what synagogues are and how they popped up. And so Jesus is going from synagogue to synagogue, which, by the way, the Apostle Paul and the apostles largely did in the book of Acts as well. So they did preach in the open air, right? Jesus did preach on the mount. He did preach in the plain. He did preach in the boats. So he did it everywhere. But one of the places he would always go to first, he would start in the church, if you will. He'd go to the Israelites. He'd go to those who had the scripture And he would help them understand how to apply the Bible to their lives. Because what is he preaching? And I put the language of kingdom teaching there because the video set this up well. When John the Baptist came, he was teaching as well. He was preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is at hand. And after he's arrested, the baton is handed off to Jesus. And Jesus is preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, this has led some liberal scholars to say John the Baptist was more important than Jesus. He's just a copycat. (laughs) Not so. John the Baptist was always pointing towards Jesus to prepare the world for Jesus. John the Baptist said, I'm not the Messiah. I'm not the Christ. So here's the difference. Same message, but when John the Baptist said, look to the king. He is coming. When Jesus preached the message, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hands, he then stands up in the synagogue and says, today the scripture has been fulfilled in your reading because I am the king. Mic drop, right? Like he was pointing to himself as the king, as the anointed one, as the Christ, as the one who is to usher in the kingdom of heaven, which is why as we go through the gospels, Yes, it's truth for your life about how to live and God's love letter, if you will, the Bible. But this kingdom language is something that's pretty foreign to us, but it's important to understand if we're going to grasp the Bible's teaching and the message of Jesus. Remember that the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary and said they would inherit the throne of his father, David, right? Of his kingdom, there will be no end. It's this idea that God's rule And God's reign is supposed to be over the entire people of God on this earth. And God's rule and reign is not a kingdom of this world. It's a kingdom from heaven. Remember, Satan's already tempted Jesus with the kingdoms of this world. That's the earlier verse, right? He said, in a moment, I'll give you all the kingdoms of this world. And Jesus rejects that. And says, no, I've come to bring repentance for the kingdom of heaven. 
And even at the crucifixion of Jesus where they said, are you the king? He said, my kingdom is not of this world. This is an altogether different kind of kingdom that finds its ways into our hearts and changes them, that God's rule and reign sets up shop inside of individuals, inside of collective groups of people, and then brings about transformation from the inside out. And the kingdoms of this world always apply pressure from the outside in. Just looking at what was happening in Russia again, where one of the dissenters was killed in prison. It's like no dissent allowed. That's, that's what the kingdom of man does. It's not how the kingdom of God works. The spirit of God comes to us. The good news of Jesus comes to us. And it applies the teachings of the whole Bible. And as Christians, we need to now read the whole Bible. Isaiah 61, of course. But everything finds its fulfillment in Jesus. Do you believe that? Say amen. Amen. You remember when I preached through Hebrews 11, going through the Old Testament, one of my goals was to show you how every person and every story points to Jesus because he is the king of the kingdom. And as Jesus goes from synagogue to synagogue, he reads the word of God and he points to himself and says, I am the one who will bring God's peace, his rule, his reign to you. Have you received Jesus as your king? Is he ruling and reigning in your life? That's what spreads like wildfire. That's the report that went out about Jesus, is that Jesus is ushering in God's kingdom, his rule, and his reign. You know, one of the things that set Jesus apart from the religious leaders, he said, this guy teaches as one with authority and not as the scribes and the Pharisees. Because the scribes and the Pharisees, they could read their Bibles, and they could cross the T's and dot the I's about the law and how to wash their hands just right. But they didn't have the power of God, and they didn't have God reigning in their teaching. And we as a church, we are called to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and to embrace the kingdom of God not be known for our political alliances like Satan wants to tempt us, not be known for all of that external power, but this internal power that is transforming us from the inside out to be on a revolutionary campaign for Jesus where we offer him to others and he transforms others with power, with unction, with the Holy Spirit. That's who Jesus is and that's what Jesus still does to this day. His message comes with power, his message comes with authority, and his message lifts our eyes from the kingdom of man to the kingdom of heaven and brings realignment to our hearts that God would rule and reign in our lives. Jesus embodies and spreads kingdom teaching. Thirdly and finally, Jesus embodies and spreads gospel glory. Jesus embodies and spreads gospel glory. It ends with the following. The report went out about him throughout all the surrounding country. He's teaching in all the synagogues and beyond, and he taught in their synagogues, what? Being glorified by all. Being glorified by a double L O. Does it surprise you? Because we're used to Jesus being rejected. We're going to see it even in Nazareth. But initially, initially, this message of his teaching and the power of the Holy Spirit brought all and wonder and glory out of the hearts of men and women. People were healed, people were delivered, and they glorified Christ. And this I call the gospel glory or the gospel, yeah, gospel glory because this good news of the kingdom brought glory to Christ, but also brings glory to us. It's been called the honeymoon period in Jesus' ministry because we'll see people give Jesus glory until he confronts their sin, until he confronts their religious power, right? Until he confronts all of these evil things and Satanic powers in the world. And glory is a funny thing, friends, right? We talked about it last week. 
But it's an interesting juxtaposition, all of this, right? Satan tempts Jesus with the kingdoms of this world. He rejects them, but then he comes to set up a kingdom, right? What else does Satan tempt him with? He tempts him with authority and glory, doesn't he, right? He's, I'm going to give you all the glory. And Satan, and Jesus resists that. And then we're told he's glorified by all. So part of you is thinking, like, he should just be deflecting glory left and right. What is going on here? Should he have glory or not? Should he have authority or not? Well, we hit it last week, and this is where the gospel glory comes in. And we as Christians must be discerning about glory. What? The glory of God, right? It comes, the crown has to come through the cross, right? Last week, Satan offered Jesus the crown without the cross, right? He wanted to exalt him in a moment, but glory comes through suffering, right? Power comes through persecution, and that is the paradox of the gospel for the Christian life, is that if you head for glory directly, you're actually going to live a dishonoring life to God. But if you humble yourself, God exalts the humble. Do you see it? And Jesus models that in his ministry because the glory that comes to him is through the teaching of the kingdom where he counters the kingdom of the devil and also where he uses his power to help and lift others up. That's not how Satan works. He uses his power to push people down. And so here we see the gospel glory that Jesus embodies. He has glory and he receives glory and he should receive glory because he is glorious and worthy of all glory. But the way that Jesus gets that glory matters to God and it matters to the world. The way he gets the glory is modeled through the gospels themselves. And that's the way we as Christians are called to pursue glory as well. At this point, Jesus turned water into wine. John records the evangelist. That's where Jesus revealed his glory. At this point, Nicodemus has already come to Jesus at night and said, Jesus, we know you've come from God. No one can do the signs you're doing unless God is with them. By this point, Jesus has already passed through the Samaritan woman at the well, telling her about the water of life that he would give that will never quench. And she and the Samaritans have already said, we know that you're the savior of the world. Jesus in this year is doing mighty, powerful miracles to exalt and glorify God and already sharing in the glory of God the Father with him. But as he confronts the evil in this world, there will be a collision course where people reject, despise, and resist Jesus Christ. Where that hostility will be leveled against him and where Jesus ultimately will suffer and die. But does that rob glory from Jesus? It does not. Because as we see as this gospel unfolds, this is the way that Jesus Christ be lifted up. He is lifted up and exalted on a cross and the crown of thorns makes him worthy of us to throw all our crowns on his feet at that final day as he wore that purple robe and was lifted up and exalted and over the placard on the cross said, here lies the king of the Jews. They were right. Here is, except far too small. Here lifted up be the king of all the world. And as Jesus Christ suffered for the world and rose from the dead, he received glory from God the Father. And also now he's receiving glory from all the world. Where every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. But it gets even better. Because here's the good news as I invite the worship band back up. Jesus not only models the power of the Holy Spirit, he gives it to you. He not only embodies the teaching of the kingdom, he sets up the kingdom in your heart. He not only receives and embodies gospel glory, but would you believe, Christian, that the glory that Jesus has, he gives it to you. That the glory that we lost in our sin at the fall, Jesus now, as we behold him, we're told in 2 Corinthians, as we behold the glory of Christ, we are being transformed by one degree of glory to another. And the Christian faith is this, is that those who have been justified in Christ Jesus will also be glorified with him. That the good news of Jesus is that he uses his glory to lift us up and to reflect that glory to the whole world. Behold the glory of Jesus and be transformed by that glory in your life. 
Sin and temptation will not be the ultimate victor in your life. Glory will. But the way that you get that glory is not by aligning yourself to power, authority, and Satan. The way you get that glory is by aligning yourself to the kingdom of Christ and Jesus Christ. Amen? Jesus embodies and spreads gospel glory. The power of the Holy Spirit and the kingdom of Christ in your life. Amen.